Good afternoon and welcome. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, January 22nd. Welcome on this snowy afternoon. Okay, so uh, looking at the agenda. The first couple pages uh, through administrative services through parks. Uh, is there any, there's nothing scarred for discussion, but is there any, any questions or anything that anyone not wants to discuss in particular on those items? No. Okay. Then we're down to engineering. Mr. Barclow. Yeah, he's wearing a tie today. So item numbers one is just payments. Number two is just the acceptance of the demo of 535 40 12th Street. Um, for item number three um, is accepting the sanitary sewer improvements along 1029 Blairsbury Road, which is the Timberline property. So up on the monitor, basically back here is where they built the building of Timberline. And when they were first building, coming up with the plans to build the building, we were originally going to have to run either a trunk sewer along the trail that you see back there in order to serve them gravity <coughs> fed, or they were gonna have to put a private force main in and pump up to Blair's Ferry, because as you know, Blair's Ferry is higher than Timberline is. Um, what they were actually able to do was we had an existing stub coming here, and they were able to raise the building enough that it could serve that building. Um, while doing that, then we had them extend the sanitary to the west, next to the church property, and it will actually serve all of this parcel that's along Lindale Drive except for this little triangle because there's not enough depth on it. It won't serve a basement, but if something like a multifamily uh, or a commercial unit that wouldn't need a ba uh, basement in there could go in there and could be served with gravity feed. Um, we do have a private lift station that goes up Lindale for all those properties on the west side of Lindale that pump up to Blair's Ferry just because Blair Blair's Ferry is so much higher than everything else. Back in the day, we looked at old plans where they tried to bring sanitary from West 8th up underneath the old railroad through Lindale, and it's just not deep enough that they couldn't get underneath the old railroad. And then at the time, the railroad, when it still existed, wouldn't let them cross the railroad. So obviously, it's now a city property. Um, so this is just accepting those parts of the improvements. They've supplied bonds for it, and it makes it so that that piece of property that hasn't done anything could potentially open up for development. What, what's the status on that project as a whole? That I don't have in front okay, of me. That's okay. I'm yep. just, just curious. Yep. I know they're making progress whenever I drive by. But. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. Number four. Next one. So I figured tonight we'll read the SUDOS manual. Tomorrow we can do, or Thursday we can do the design. Um, yep. Um, so this is our specifications. So a book this thick is basically how the contractors have to build things. Um, the other book that we have is how you design things. Um, we switched from the Cedar Rapids Metro to SUDAS three or four years ago. Uh, just so you know, Cedar Rapids now is converting to SUDAS if they haven't already. So they're catching up with the times, but this is a statewide standard. A lot of the details in it are the same as DOT. So it makes it easier for those contractors that are not necessarily familiar with the Marion code, can come in and design things, um, build them, and bid them. Um, and then item five, we write special provisions that are specific to the city of Marion. Things like we want certain fire hydrants that you have to buy from the water department so that when the fire department shows up, they only have one hose. They don't have 12 different connections where they got to figure out which connection do they have to do. So a lot of the special provisions that you see, a lot of them have to do with the water main stuff in there. There were a few changes in there that were highlighted in, in yellow, but for the most part, there's not a lot that changed from last year to this year. So is that, is that updated annually? Yes. Okay. So we have quarterly meetings where we meet with districts. So there's six districts in the state. We give recommendations and vote, and then it goes to the central board, and then they decide. So it's not something that's just changed overnight. There's a process that we have to go through. But so if there's changes we want to make, we send a recommendation to them, and 
we'll see where it goes. So some of those recommendations we've sent to them has been denied in other areas, so then we just put them in our supplementals if they won't put them in the actual specification. This way it's vetted through the entire state. Okay. So I did include the list of summary of what changed, but I won't go into any of those details unless you guys want me to. And you're recommending that we approve them? I'm recommending okay. that we approve them. <laughs> really not a choice, is it? And then I just want to point out quick, we do have Jay Kahn, our new assistant city engineer in the back. Welcome. Joining the city of Marion, he was at Anderson Bogert down the road out of the Marion office. So. We've seen him around, so yep. yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the team. And that's all I have for the consent portion. Okay, any questions on the engineering? There's nothing start under community development, but are there any specific items people want to ask questions about or are wondering about? This is the time to do it. Nope. Okay. And then there was one item under city manager's office. <coughs> Anything on that? This is setting a public hearing date. Okay. Then the next part is the consent agenda, the second part of the consent agenda. Anything under that? But nothing is starred. Any items that need to be discussed? Okay. On to the regular agenda items. Administrative services. A couple items there. Nothing? Okay, there's one item under police and fire. Okay, then on the parts. The, uh, oh yes, go ahead. This is a question about the cameras. Mm -hmm. and, and when I <clears throat> read the write-up and the request for that, it talked about the cameras turn on, <coughs> start recording 30 seconds before they're activated. How in the heck do they do that? It's um, because I thought you needed to constantly push the recording. If constantly it, recording. Yeah, if, that, if it's always on and it's, it always has a buffer where it's recording, <coughs> like a loop, yeah. and then what it does is it, it generates the ability for them to go back when they hit that record button. It'll go back the previous 30 seconds and pick up that. Does that make sense? So it's yeah. So they're oh, so they're always recording. It's always on. It's always yeah. It's always picking up. Yeah, so okay. yeah, it's technically it's it's always recording. Always recording. But yeah. It's not going to save. Does that make sense? So yes. if I leave it on all the time, it's recording. I'm not going to be able to go back right. and pick up all of council. So you'll I just get be able to go back and pick up. So if just I, when you push it, record, then it go back. It's going to pick up 30 seconds. Saves 30 seconds prior. Correct. So it's always got a loop okay. going where we can pick up the pre. It's called pre-event pre recording. I did not know that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thanks. Trial and error. They worked on that one. Exxon has a great product with this and. Uh, the automatic uploads that we're having now, it's, it's, we're very happy with it. Good. So, um, I, I assume this is a budgeted item, something that we've. Heard. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, as you, the, the memo notes, we, uh, we deferred forty-four thousand dollars last year that we did not have to spend. Um, this year, we're about twenty-seven thousand uh, dollars over budget to get first year funded. Um, but we saved some significant money and other costs in that same line item through 911 board that's going to offset. So overall budget, we should be good. Okay. Any questions on that one? Thank you, Chief. Uh, under parks, we have one item that is starred. So Mr. Carolyn. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh. Yeah, the item on the agenda under parks is something that we've discussed as we went through the CIP process this year. Um, so it is an identified item in the five-year plan, and that would be the purchase of the lot at 2350 Indian Creek Road. If you're familiar with this area, at one time it was a driving range associated with the Indian Creek, uh, Indian Creek Country Club. Um, so the city, uh, we have all the property within this area. 
what uh, purchase of uh, this lot will provide for. We have a sewer, main sewer trunk line that <coughs> runs through the area. Uh, it'll provide us access uh, for service of that uh, uh, sanitary sewer line. Also provides uh, the city access to the area to do any type of restoration of Indian Creek uh, if we have flooding events, those type of things. And then the area through here was uh, at one time it was used as a borrow pit when they were building the 29th Avenue Bridge. We have since last year we went in and, and we replanted that to uh, prairie grass and pollinators as part of our 1,000 acre uh, uh, pollinator initiative. Uh, so that it also provides access for uh, maintenance of that area also. So again, one of those items that we did identify in the CIP, we've done an appraisal of the property, been through that process. Uh, abstract is uh, with uh, the city's uh, attorney right now doing a review of that. So uh, one of the steps in the process was to approve the purchase agreement. And so that's what's on the agenda for Thursday. Yeah, how are we accessing it now? Right now, for the most part, we jump the curb up on 29th Avenue, uh, well, or we kind of find our way through that open lot at times too. Without right now, a right, so. of, without a real right to do it. Without a real right of way yeah. uh, access that's provided yeah, to so. us, but that's <laughs> what uh, because it was provided for years. It's yeah, kind so of I mean, this is a necessary go in at. thing. But then. most of our equipment, we've we've come up on the upper end, which isn't a great place to. To get in and to come down over the bank to get in there. So uh, it's, it's good to have this access. Yes, sir. Mike, did the electric company own something back in there? That would have been down farther, uh, down more towards uh, 10th Street. They're building those two houses. There was a there was a substation at one time in that area that has uh, since I, I believe it's removed <coughs> now. It's gone completely now. Uh, so that's all, and the adjacent property owner, if I remember right, I believe he purchased, I, I believe he purchased that property. Don't yeah, because he won 25000 for that lot, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Nice game. Yeah, so we have adjacent on the other side, closer yeah. to 10th Street, there's some city property there on the corner, then there was the substation, and I believe that the property owner uh, on the other side purchased that from the power company. I, I think we'd have a real good chance of selling half of that lot to the neighbor. They maintain it and have been. And you, I don't believe I, I mentioned this, but one of the other things that this lot would, would provide in the future uh, would be uh, to, to develop some type of uh, collector or feeder trail to the, I, I stated in my memo, um, to the uh, Indian Creek trail system. And I think, you know, depending on, you know, what we would look at from a design point for that, uh, whether we would want to split that lot or to be able to provide some of those uh, landscaping elements associated with that at that entrance to buffer if it would, if we, you know, it'll be intermittent um, uh, for maintenance activities, but if we would design that uh, uh, trail element in there, we might need to, to have that extra uh, lot space to do some buffering for the adjacent neighbors. So we would need to take that into consideration. I think it's great that we own it. <coughs> great move. Yeah. That would make that would make sense to have that as a trail uh, entrance. Even we sell half uh, of it in the future. So we would we put it in the sidewalk? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we. Uh, we're, we're Hold on, right. I don't think that's uh, honestly. So the sidewalk never got put in. No, that's the Correct. only piece that's not done. Yeah. So no. for years and years now, we've been telling them to put the sidewalk in. So if they want 55000 for it. Maybe we should knock a 1000 or two off because we're going to have to put a sidewalk in that we've been telling them to do for years. And I'm being serious. I wasn't sure. I drove by today to see if there was a sidewalk there or not, but snow covered, so I couldn't tell. So I wasn't sure if they had done it or not. But they're getting away with it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Personally, you know, that's n not necessarily under the umbrella of the Parks and, and Rec Department to facilitate that. <clears throat> so I'd have to do a little checking with staff to see just exactly where that's at in process. I, I do not know. I can't answer that question. Um, but it's definitely something we could look at. I know that the offer is there in front of the City Council uh, now with an, what the appraised price was. I don't know that I, I doubt that the uh, sidewalk in or out was taken into consideration as far as the overall appraisal price um, 
something that we definitely could go back and make that, you know, ask for that adjustment. I don't know how the owner would feel about that at this point. Um, but again, you know, we definitely, if you, if, if this council gives direction to go back uh, to do that, I definitely will. I see the, I'm sorry, I, I see the, go ahead. The, the positives of owning it, and I've thought for years that we should for that for this exact reason but the fact that they're kind of they're getting out of what they've been told to do for years and they've been saying they were going to do it and saying they're going to do it and say they were going to do it and never did it and now they're getting out of doing it and then we're going to have to pay for it which was there would be one <laughs> thing in that conversation that we would have to, to to fold into that with the sidewalk because of the, 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 the equipment that we would be taking across that, I know I, I've talked to uh, Ryan Miller a little bit about this, is that you know some of the equipment is very heavy. So we would overbuild uh, that sidewalk. Uh, we would probably be putting some type of uh, apron in or approach off of Indian Creek. Now we would definitely want to, uh, the thickness of the sidewalk in that area, uh, we'd want to have over thickness on that. So. All those things would need to be taken into a little bit of consideration. I'll, I'll be honest uh, with you. Well, I'm not sure what the overall square footage is over there for that sidewalk. What that what that actual cost uh, would be. I, I don't I don't have those you know numbers available. <coughs> Something we'd have to see where we're at with that. I don't know if there was a cost, Mike, that we had uh, or, or Tom back in the day when that was. I, I can remember the conversation. I just don't know where we ended up with it. Yeah, I don't know if Dave had a the cost on it or I don't think we gave them a cost I think we just gave them a deadline to do what they're supposed to do yeah I'm I mean would there have been uh and I'm sorry I keep talking oh, go ahead. was there were there were there been uh since they didn't do it was there any type of um lean lean thank you can't think of the word for a second lean put on the property for that no I don't I don't think we got to that point because it, it was the owner was the same owner that had not the lot adjacent I think they had the same property in the area. Bussy. Uh, yeah, Bussy, and then there was a change of ownership, so it wasn't, because we're not buying it from Bussy. It's it's someone who bought them from, so there was a change, like we had processed the abatement order to put the sidewalk in, and then they had sold it, and then we processed the abatement order on the new people, and I believe they put everything in, and then we started to have that, because the conversation on the acquisition has been going on for, Months? A, a long time. Oh, so I think that might have been some of that as well. I, I understand what you're saying, but I, some of it's been held up for conversation about trying to acquire it too. Uh, and we don't know, we don't know for sure whether or not the appraisal accounted for the lack of sidewalk. I mean, it, it might. I, have I'd to, have to go have back to look and at read the through it again, to be honest with you, just to see if there was any well, noting to that, and I don't recall that. Most uh, of the, I mean, most of the time an appraisal would be on the big lot. And there, there, big it's lot the average the of... So I'm assuming that it wasn't. Um, yeah, but if there's any improvements on there, which is a sidewalk, it would be it would part be of the... Correct. It would be it part of the value. It would be. If there were improvements on the property. I mean, it's not just correct. the bare ground. So... And I would think that that'd be accounted for in there if there was a sidewalk. Oh. You and might you might ask the appraiser. Yeah, we could we could definitely do that. Um, I, I I just and and I don't know that it necessarily needs to factor in the decision, but I will say that the current owner of this property has been very patient with the city and going through the process that we've gone through to get to the point where we are today. And to hold and to hold the property for us, mm -hmm. um, you know, we uh, when it was originally uh, brought forward uh, from the, the current owner, whether we'd be interested in it or not, I, I'm I'm going to say when I say months, uh, we're probably going uh, probably on eight months or more uh, that we've been working on this. So the, the, it it came to the city. One of the things that we did because we were going through a new CIP process that we wanted to include it in the CIP and have it vetted through that. So that, you know, that, that uh, extended the timeline out to get through it as we all are well aware of. So they have been very patient and uh, I definitely will go back and, 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 and ask questions if, if the council would, but I do want to bring that forward that they have been very patient through this process.
Other questions? Excuse me, Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, one thing that has been brought to my attention, I believe it's resolution 24829, is a uh, resolution that defers the installation of sidewalks uh, for up to five years. That was entered October 1st, 2016. So I believe they're still under a deferment. Def Am I reading that correctly, Mayor? 2015. 20, 2015, I'm sorry, September 3rd, 2015. So they're still within their time frame under the deferment that the council passed. Okay. Also just That's as, a relevant. Yeah. as a practical matter, I don't know what a sidewalk costs, but if this starts to turn into a nasty legal fight, that's not going to be free as well, so. Right. Yeah. Was that for just that specific property or was that for Long Indian Creek? 2090 and 2350. 2, huh. So before Thursday, if I could get a, some clarification, what would this council like to see from staff before Thursday, if anything? If there's a resolution saying five years deferred on that, and then that's news to me, so that. Fine. That's satisfactory? Yeah, that's okay. satisfactory. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, on to engineering again. Let's talk about that after. We have every item <laughs> start under engineering. It's only six items, and several of them are related. So items. One and two is a TAC request on Commercial Avenue um, in this area with Ecolypse going in there. They're expanding rather quickly. We've had an issue with parking in there, and so the <coughs> PD has been called down there to write tickets. As you can see on the north side, there's not a lot of parking available because of all the driveways, and it's actually signed as no parking. Um, the south side allows parking, and what they're doing is they're encroaching too much on the handicap ramp that goes north-south. And so the PD is actually having to go out there and issue tickets. Mm -hmm. It's causing issues that the fire trucks would have to get in there to make that churn. So tax recommendation is to put a sign up, no parking, here to corner 35 feet east of that ramp. So it will should solve the issues. Ecolypse is in the process of buying some land, releasing some land, so that they can get an additional parking lot built down there for their additional employees. So it's a temporary thing, but it will um, also help with safety at the same time. So that is tax recommendation. Okay, questions on that? That's pretty straightforward. Next. All right, item number three is the receive and file of the petition, which you guys should have had in your council packet. Um, basically, the petition is for removal of the light completely. There was 14 properties that had signed the petition. Um, some of them had two to three signatures per residence, so I just listed the, the residents that were on there. Um, that was in your packet, so we're receiving and filing that petition. Okay. Item four is receive and file from the developer, um, stating that he wants the light to stay there, and if it moves, um, he would like the city to reimburse him. Basically, when we decide where the lights need to go, they kind of have a catalog that they can pick from of what style of lights, and he picked a fancy, it doesn't necessarily change the LED output, but the actual aesthetics of the pole itself, and he picked a fancier coach style light that goes in the subdivision to go with that neighborhood to have a nicer light. Um, so he's not in favor of switching it out for like a cobra head that would change the aesthetics of the houses that he has to sell for the light that he had to pay for. So this is just, I basically notified him that we had this petition and that this stuff was going on so that he was aware of it. And so he just wrote this letter to be received and filed. And a copy of this was in your council packet. Okay. So number five, um, this was a picture that I took um, a couple months ago before the snow was on the ground, as you can tell. The light in question is there on the left side of the page. 
Um, the house with the petitioner is to the right. Um, you can see that the light pollution isn't exiting um, the right-of-way very far at all because it's on the north side of the road. Um, and I don't know, there's some other pictures where you can see other lights that are being emitted during Christmas um, that are on the houses. This is the um, preliminary plat, and this is where we'd establish where the lights are going to go and also the no parking. So the red dash lines that you see are the no parking areas and then the light. We don't specify to a line what side of the street it has to be on. This is the subject property right here that's requesting the petition. As you can see, there's going to be houses built right behind them that will help block that light and may add additional lights, such as porch lights, um, to that area. But the dynamic of that subdivision is going to end. I mean, the person right here is looking at this light right now in their backyard until that house gets built, for example. And the light that's here um, is also shining back towards them as well. They might not have windows on that side. Mike, isn't that light, the light isn't really right there, isn't it further west? Yeah, from, this from is where just you a, have it on that. Yeah, I mean, this is drawn in the center of the flat? road. Right. So it's yeah, further it should be west. on the lot line. Yeah. yeah. So it's even further away than yeah, what I believe it it's right here. Yeah. So again, she'll have two lots that'll have houses to block that light yeah. eventually. So basically, uh, TAC came up with five um, different alternatives that we can look at and rank them in order of preference. So number one being the most preferred, five being the least preferred. So number one is leaving the existing subdivision light where it is per our resolution number 7714. Copy that was also in your packet. Um, number two is switching out the actual light bulb from an LED to a high pressure sodium. There are ones on Irish Drive that are the, the high pressure sodium that they could switch out. That would be just a temporary switch. Um, once that high pressure sodium bulb burns out, it will be replaced with an LED light because that's the way that utilities are going now. They're all going to LED lights. Um, the third one is changing out the existing light for a concrete pole with a luminaire. Alliant is willing to do that at no cost to the city. Again, it changes the aesthetics of the subdivision, and the person who has to sell the lots is not in favor of that option. Number four is moving the existing light to the east, the intersection of Williams Drive and Shady Oak. This was recommended at one time from the petitioner, um, but it sounds like when she went and got signatures, no one was in favor of this because they weren't in favor of where it was. Alliant will do that for about... $5,500 to move that. And then the fifth option is to remove the light per the request, which no TAC member is for. It also opens up to liability now that that light has been established. If you take that light away and there's an accident, they could say that there used to be a light there and that I had that accident because there was no light. Doesn't mean that they would win in court, but you can sue anybody for anything. Okay, go ahead. Mike, quick question. What is the difference in the brightness between uh, an LED and an HPS bulb? What would be the difference that, and how that would look? So I, know the, I understand the efficiency. Yeah, so I don't know that the luminaires would change too much. I'm not a light expert. It would be more of a calming, more orange color than the white. Light. It's bright white. It's more yellow? Yep. Okay. And if you drive out there now, if the light's on Irish Drive or the high-pressure sodium, so you can see the difference between the two. I don't know so that the, the others are? There. Yep. Okay. So you can tell basically the ones that are the yellow-orange color, the high-pressure sodium, the ones that are white are LED. So you're saying that eventually there would be some houses built there that would block the light completely? Correct. I don't know about completely, and that could be a different source. It could be well, a porch well, light that adds light that shines well, right I, I know. I mean, but we're, we're, right now we're talking about the, our, our light. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we can't worry about porch lights or neighbor's <coughs> lights, but our light yes. that she's complaining about, that she's saying is you know, causing her issues, um, that likely will be eventually blocked. Her, 
I mean, I, I drive by there, and I, I don't see how it's intruding on, on their, there's no light from that light pole intruding on their on their lot. No. But, so, but I don't know, so I don't know if it's just looking out the window and seeing it, that's, that's the issue, I, you know, but my question is, would it make sense then to go with that option of changing the light bulb to just buy some time until the, the other houses go up that would block the light altogether or, or partially or, or? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an option. Um, and that's item number six. Then that was the, the resolution, how I wrote it, because I didn't, that way I gave you guys an opportunity to do what you guys wanted to do as far as an action item. And that way you can amend the motion or if you want me to change it for Thursday to a different alternative. But um, eventually it's going to be LED anyways. Um, you know, you change it out today, and those two lots don't get built on, and it stays, the high-pressure sodium burns out and becomes an LED issue, you can go back in here. You know, I don't, you don't know when those two lots are going to sell. At the rate that, that houses are going up over there, you know, we might, it might be soon. Yeah. What What's the life expect expectancy of one of those sodium? It varies. I mean, just like when you buy the LED, you know, it's supposed to have nine-year shelf life or longer. I've had LEDs in my house burn out, and I'm sure you've had the same thing. So yeah. you have an average lifespan, but it doesn't mean it's going to last. Well, I mean, long. are they supposed to be last for a couple of years? R Ryan, Ryan probably, probably knows. <laughs> two to three years. Two to three? Yeah. And they've been up on Irish Drive since it's been built? The bulbs that they're going to switch out? I don't know if they've switched them out or not. But they're aligned light, so. Yeah. So, so my comment, I've driven out there as well, and this is before winter, and I agree with Nick's comment 100%. I, you could not, I'm confident if I stood in her backyard, I could not read a book off of that light, okay? So that said, I'm fine as it is with an LED light. The only consolation I would consider would be changing the bulb out, but I'm not sure it's worth it, and I'm not sure she'd be happy with that either. So given the circumstance that she's against any light, which is kind of what we've been hearing, you know, I'd lean towards just leaving it like it is with an LED. I don't think you're going to satisfy her. So that'd be my position. <coughs> oh. I, too, I, when other, I look. <laughs> yeah, I ahead. didn't see. You know, I wish I had a light that bright in our neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, you know, to her it is an issue, and I, I'd like to at least be able to say we've tried something is my is my personal position that we at least tried so that we at least tried to accommodate in some way um, I'd only consider that if she would say that will make a difference but if she, she says she's until told, she's I know done. if she's totally against any light then then you leave it LED and it doesn't make a difference but yeah that'd be consolation just for all the effort you know I, I credit the amount of effort she has put into this. I really do. <laughs> okay. But I applaud that part, but, you know, not the logic or reasoning. I understand. But it, it's important to her. So I, I think to say that we are trying to find a solution, I think it goes a long ways. I, other, I just other wanted, to, yeah, I wanted yeah. to chime in and, um, and support that. I think it was the second one, right? And switching the light out. The only concern being is what if the light goes in 30 days, right? I mean, we don't know the, the lifespan of the light, but I would agree with Nick on this one. She's really put a lot of work and effort into this. Might not make her happy, um, but I think this is sort of a, a good place for us to give it a try without spending a lot of time and resources um, to, to, to respond to her concerns. Anything to add? No. Oh, okay. Okay. <coughs> so then item six on the agenda is then action on the light. So how it's written right now is resolution number approving the modification of the light on Williams Drive west of Shady Oak Drive to be temporarily changed out from LED to high pressure sodium. So if that's so you would vote that in if that's how you want it, or you would vote it down or modify it depending on how you guys want to act on Thursday. And, and there's no real, <coughs> there's no expense to the city in that. that you, and, um, you know, if for some reason it doesn't last or, you know, I mean, we're no worse off. I mean, you know, it's just at least we've tried something and it might work. We'll let her decide. 
that there's a potential it might work. So, yeah. And I don't know if she'll be here on Thursday. She was notified and got the TAC report the same time you guys did. So. True. Okay. Anything further on that one? <laughs> okay, community development. Mr. Treharn. Yes, Your Honor. The, uh, the first item there is a second consideration of the rezoning out east of 13, and I think there is a lengthy staff report. We went through this at the last meeting. Um, if there's questions on it, I'd be happy to answer those, but it is the second, Thursday be the second reading. And we have received a request to waive the, the final reading and move to adoption, which are number two and three. Um, I guess I would ask, Ren I don't think council person Gedalia is gonna be here on Thursday, is that correct? She will be here Thursday, she's just missing today. Oh, oh. she's here Thursday? Uh, that was my understanding. She's gone. No. She's, not gonna be she's gone, gone both days? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, and is Councilman Sternad gonna be here? Do you know? Yeah, we, okay. I was, he should be back. I had it switched around, yeah. so I thought he was gonna be gone both days. Okay, she will be gone both days and he'll be back on Thursday. Right. And, the, and the only reason I ask is because there's been a request to waive the, the final reading and if, if there were gonna be two gone, then that wouldn't be an option. It would change how the agenda would read, so. Uh, I believe that can still occur if one person is gone and there's a, a unanimous vote to move forward with the waiver. So if there are concerns with that, you know, please let me know. Um, otherwise, um, there's the request will be on the agenda. And if it is approved, uh, we would move to uh, uh, number four and five, which are the preliminary site development plan and the preliminary plat for Rookwood uh, Estates, uh, consistent with the uh, staff report for the rezoning. And I believe all that information was provided at the last meeting as well. Unless there's desire for me to walk oh. through that, which I can, uh, I would I would just uh, defer that conversation. Um, just so you're aware, that would that would bring it all the way up and, uh, and allow the prop project to move forward and then the first final plat would come forward um, for development. So that'd be the last you'd see of that project moving it forward, so. So what's the reason for asking for the waiver of the third reading? Um, they just want to, get the project started and move it forward. But everybody does. Uh, Absolutely. You know, ha have you heard Have you heard any other comments from the neighborhood or any, have you received any? No, uh -uh. no, I, and, I, and I think one of, the, one of the reasons may be that no one, I don't think anybody addressed the council at the public hearing. And so sometimes when that occurs, the developers do ask for that to be moved forward as well. Uh, so um, totally up to the council. Yeah, I, I guess my personal opinion is that if there's no real, um, uh, deadline or some sort of hardship that's going to be caused because uh, because of the period of time for waiting for the third reading uh, on something like this my, my personal feeling is that I, I wouldn't be in favor of it everybody else might be but um, you know I, a lot of times when we're, we're waiving third readings on amendments to SUDAS or <laughs> something like that I, you know I can see that no one's going to have an objection and uh, we did have some concerns from neighbors. We, there are people out there that have concerns about this. I, my, my personal feeling is, is that I wouldn't be in favor of waiving the third reading to give everyone a chance that, that, has, that, that, that may have a concern to come in and express those concerns. But you have a comment? Yeah, yeah, I echo that also. I had someone in that neighborhood reach out to me that was not in favor of it. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And. Uh, um, I have not had a, an opportunity to sit down with this individual yet because of some medical issues. But um, so I would say to not waive it also, just because of that. Yeah, generally I'd be in favor of doing that. Yeah. Again, because if you know, I would usually don't have a problem with that. But in this particular case, uh, we didn't have anybody at the public hearing, but I do know there were a number of people that were at the PNZ meeting. There so were, yes. I think. If it was clean all the way through and nobody was at any of the meetings, I'd be more apt to say I'd support that. But mm -hmm. given the fact that there have been a number of people, maybe not at our city council <coughs> meeting, there were a number of people at the PNZ meeting, I think that does indicate that there certainly is the possibility that they may still come for some one of these readings. So based on that, I'd, I'd support uh, Nick and Will as well on their so I'll just, I'll go ahead to, I think that it'll probably be appropriate to receive and file the request 
but I won't put the other items on the agenda, understanding that there likes <coughs> likely wouldn't be support for that. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anything else under development? No one has questions on item six. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Mr. Pluckon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So the uh, City Council at the uh, first meetings uh, in, in January had received and filed a draft memorandum of agreement with the uh, YMCA regarding operations of the Marion Rec Center. Uh, but that was um, received. The council really didn't have much time to see it and so we wanted to bring it back for uh, discussion with the council to see if there were questions, concerns, any additional items that needed to be addressed. Uh, the YMCA um, at the end of the month has a board meeting so if there are any changes or adjustments that made are going, uh, need to be made to the agreement they'd have the opportunity to run those past their board, um, get approval from the board and then bring back the agreement for final approval uh, from the city council in February. There was a series of questions that uh, Councilwoman Gadela had uh, related to the agreement that she wanted to have answered. I did forward those on to the Parks and Recreation staff since Mike had been involved with the direct negotiations of the agreement and also to the staff for the YMCA. So uh, I didn't know if Council had questions for them. If you wanted to address them directly to, to Zach or Steve, they're here or had further questions for Mike or if you wanted to go straight into <coughs> the questions that Renee had. Proceed. Okay. So, uh, Zach, did you want to come up? Because you'll be the one that'll have to answer the questions that she had. <laughs> So the first question that Renee had was related to the contribution amount um, being 7.3 million since it is more than the initial ask and that in the agreement that it, it talks about a naming rights donor um, but doesn't specify the sum that um, they would have to pay in order to receive those namings rights and that that name of the facility might be shared with the city. Um, she would wanted it to be quantified or and so that it's clearly defined and um, wanted to uh, her position was is that naming rights for a donor should be um, some at least commensurate with what the city is doing. First and foremost, thank you, Your Honor, for having us today. Um, our CEO, Bob Carlson, is out sick with the flu, so that's why you get me, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, I don't think you have been introduced to our chief operating officer, Steve Dolezal, who will be answering all the questions um, this afternoon. He has been working behind the scenes with Mike Carolyn's staff, um, with um, b behind the scenes with the um, rec programming, so that's why he um, understands all the operations agreement inside and out. So um, I will turn it over to you. The last question I have, do you guys have a copy of the agreement? Do you want a hard yeah. copy? Do you, we you, have, you one. have one right now? Okay. I, you, okay. I mean, I, we have it on our email. But Does anyone else? Oh, I have that one. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to Steve with that. Good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for uh, allowing us to be here to answer your questions tonight and thanks for um, the ability to work with Mike and his staff on this collaboration. They've been great to work with and we're excited to see this thing come to fruition and carry out that partnership. So first question, Lon, do I need to address anything with the 7.3 or is that clear now with the, the amount of the ask? That's spelled out specifically That's in the proposal. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, the second question related to um, the contribution, the naming right of a donor, and our um, recognition committee kind of established guidelines on what that would look like uh, way back in the beginning when we set a uh, task force uh, up for that. And that, um, it's in the two to three million dollar range is what we would look for for a naming opportunity for the facility. Um, and I think, you know, doing something like that, Lon, um, you know, you kind of suggested if we got somebody at the end of the day here that kind of came up with the two to three million dollars to put this thing over the top for us, that we'd be all for that and try to figure out a way that not, uh, you know, just somebody's name goes on this, but to not lose sight of the why and the city. Next question. Or is there any more follow up on that? That address so anything for council? Just is that clear? I mean, go ahead. 
I mean, if you look at city facilities, um, the only one that immediately jumps to mind, we have the Nancy Miller Library, we have the Kloppenstein Amphitheater. Uh, so the city does have facilities that are named, but I don't think anybody would confuse the library with Nancy Miller. It's the Marion Library, and Nancy was a key donor in making that building come to fruition. So when this was proposed, that's how I looked at it, is you know, the name that would be proposed by the city wouldn't necessarily be to name it for a specific person but to come up with a name for how the service that the facility would provide, whether it was the Marion Athletic Complex or something along those lines, and not be specific to the name of an individual. They were looking at it from the standpoint of the name of an individual purchasing it or buying that right to commemorate it after someone. Correct. So then the second question that she had posed was about the numbers of the advisory committee. It specifies three of them in there for the city and then didn't uh, specify the overall number of the committee members and um, she just wanted to see some clarification on that. I think maybe the issue is where it says will consist of a minimum of seven members. Uh, I think what we were trying to achieve was a balance where the city council points three, the Y chooses three, and then jointly we chose another person. So that's kind of how we got to the seven. I think we can work with Mike uh, over the next, uh, before we have to have this uh, final draft submitted, to either just remove the minimum or come up with the percentages so that it's e uh, equivalent. Not, a, not an issue. Okay. I think the reason we've tried to put a minimum of seven was there was some excitement you know, to try to get more than seven people involved on the advisory committee. So that's why the minimum got thrown in there. Uh, she did have a question about Article 4, which refers to uh, an expense allocation for Parks and Rec um, that had been previously discussed and it wasn't attached to the copy of the document. Um, I did not have a copy of it with the one that I had, but if that's available, we can forward that on. I think just to tie that back, uh, Mike, myself, um, and Zach Wolf and Bob are to get together to determine that amount. I think we had to reschedule a meeting on that. So that's to be determined yet. However, in the pro forma that we have, there are um, dollars set aside in the pro forma that the Y was already anticipating uh, spending on a sports director. So it should be an easy allocation. If I could, Your Honor, uh, on that. If I could address yes, the council uh, on that subject, I, I do think that you know we, we can present language to the council in the document um, that speaks to um, that revenue stream. Uh, but I think that at this point too, uh, trying to develop and put together the package of programming, those type of things, and what that 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 will look like, I do believe that. Um, we might not be able to give you an exact amount of what that, that would look like because that's always going to be changing as we move through the process. We can set uh, maybe a parameter of what that would look like, but I, I just don't know that, that we can specifically set a target uh, identifiable number just because the programming is still evolving, what that's going to look like, what that capacity is going to be. Uh, what that uh, impact will be on the parks and rec department, par parks and excuse me, parks and rec department versus the Y. So there needs to be a little bit of uh, ability in that document to, to to generalize, I guess, in that area, and not drill down to a certain dollar <laughs> amount. I just don't think we're there yet. And then uh, the next question is under 5B where at, uh, the, this uh, article is related to being new programming and enhanced programming for the community being provided. And in 5B it specifically includes the word prom. Uh, she just wanted clarification that that would be open to the school districts that serve the city of Marion and not just one. Um, just to make it clear that it was open to all school districts in Marion. Yeah, and to answer that, you know, a couple different ways. First of all, I think the actual idea on prom was an adult prom, so uh, kind of thinking outside the box. But to answer the question directly at the, the school districts, absolutely be available to both. Welcome, both of them.
Yeah, and for reference, Alburnett currently um, rents and uses the, the Helen G. Nassau Plancy downtown for their after prom. Uh, and then next question was, um, she was reiterating a concern that, uh, actually just say similar to number six, I feel strongly that the Y should also offer Marion businesses who employ full-time workers and can, pr can, can prove it annually, some type of discount. Uh, it doesn't have to be as generous as the one for residents, but they're taxpayers too. That's how she had it phrased. I think Bob kind of hit on this originally when Renee brought this up at one of the other council meetings, but the Y has a corporate membership um, policy and structure already for discounts that we offer to anyone and it's it's based on a partnership. We want to, to give these discounts as well to the Marion uh, employers, but um, you know what we ask back from them is that someone at their company is engaged and help promoting the Y and the services uh, and kind of be that messenger for us and so that we kind of get a win-win. So yes, we're absolutely open to, to continuing that policy and, and offering that and actually promoting it with all those employers. And then the last one point that she had brought up was related to the last sentence at number six, where it says presented to the advisory committee for review and implementation. Uh, she had requested that the word approval needs to be in there as well. Uh, we could take a look at that one uh, with uh, Mike and his staff. I think the reason that the word approval was not in there is because ultimately the the advisory committee will not have fiduciary responsibility. That resides at the corporate level of the YMCA board. Um, so typically how the advisory committee would work is that they would kind of recommend the, the pricing or the structure, the range, uh, rates to the full board. So any questions on that? Is that clear? <coughs> I think that was the last question that Renee had asked. Is that correct? Yes, there were six. Any other questions from the rest of you? Any questions on any part of this document? No. If there is something um, that does come up, we would like any corrections and edits. Hopefully, like um, Mr. Pluckon mentioned, we'll, we'll be having a board meeting a week from tomorrow, Wednesday at noon. We also have the city attorney that I believe has to look this over before you guys can officially agree to it since it, it is operations agreement. So we have to get that in the works. And then um, if we can get that in the next seven to eight days um, all approved and whatnot, that would be great. So then we can get this on the docket for the official ask and vote on February 5th and 7th that week. And we are we just had a contractor meeting today. We're looking at moving forward February 8th if everything goes as planned. So I know we're a few months behind schedule. but few months after January 1st, 2020 is not going to kill the project, hopefully, but that's where we're at. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Anything on the last item there? No, just uh, wanted to ask the council. Um, you saw what we're putting together to kind of pilot these presentations to use the same format. If you do have any suggestions or in this on this specific project, if there's anything you'd like to have covered on it, on it let me know. Uh, otherwise, we'll make the presentation on it on Thursday. I'm planning on uh, covering more the uh, imminent project in it, which is the uh, runway widening and reconstruction project and the addition of the lighting. That's the current project in the CIP. Uh, as that project overall moves forward, the airport committee will continue to review proposed projects and make recommendations to council uh, for future improvements that would be coming ahead. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you give us a status report on when we will have the when you'll have the budget packet ready? I'm going to check right after this. I know Zach was working on the transmittal memo for it uh, when we came in. So. Okay. Yes, sir. Connor, uh, the only item I have is I'd like to compliment Public Works on what a great job they did in our streets the last two days, and they're going to be at it again tomorrow, but <laughs> they did a great job. I wish you'd let them know, at least I feel that way. You want to drive a snowplow? Mm hmm? You want to drive one of the snowplows? I could do that for a while. 
I would just like to lodge a request that um, one of these snow events start at like 7.30 and end at 3 o'clock and Monday through Friday rather than starting at 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock on a Friday. <laughs> that might get me. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.